Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're tuning in from. Welcome to our Friday workflow webinar series. We're super excited to bring you the topic today, which is how to select the right capsule for your artist. We have an awesome panel of folks joining us. We have Jason Spence, who works for Solotech. He's a monitor mixer, does all kinds of award shows. Uh, Brett Scoop Blandin, uh, who's front of house for Lady A. Tim Hibbert, front of house for Cardi B and monitors for Common. Adam Robinson, who is also a monitor engineer for Josh Groban and Trans Siberian Orchestra. And Paul Hager, who is front of house for Miley Cyrus, Beck, and Devo. So we have all kinds of different genres and perspectives, uh, front of house monitors coming at you. So uh, we're really excited to have everybody join us. Uh, a little housekeeping for those of you who are tuning in. If you have any questions for us, uh, there is a little section where there you can post your questions. We'll be asking them of our panelists as we go through. So feel free to throw your questions in as we go. So, all right, let's get started. So the first thing I we'd like you to cover is really, you know, what is your thought process? You know, you have an artist. How do you how do you figure out what the right capsule is for them? Anybody want to go first? Otherwise, I'll call on people. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll start. Uh, uh, how I choose a capsule uh, probably really started from uh, starting in the studio. I started out working in the studio and then migrated to live sound. So uh, the first one is what's going to give me the best performance, not what's the best sounding. As, as much as I like to uh, have everything sound right and sound good, uh, I got to choose the mic that the artist is most comfortable with to get the best performance because it comes down to the music, right? So that's usually my first thing. Um, one of the artists I mixed, um, Anita Baker, she's um, challenging to say the least. Um, uh, 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 she was comfortable on a Beta 58A. No point in arguing with her. That's what she's comfortable with. That's how I'm going to get the best performance. Let her do it. So. Uh, you know, uh, and then next would be, of course, uh, sound quality. So if I uh, am working with the artist more like Amy Grant, who's about the exact polar opposite of uh, uh, someone like a personality of Anita Baker, I could choose something uh, that's going to sound better. So uh, on her, um, so I'm looking for sound quality. So I'm going to try out a few different mics. Um, but, uh, and then third is going to be application. What's the environment I'm working in? Uh, is it a tight stage? Is it a loud ambient noise uh, or just a loud stage? Um, you know, uh, I'm going to choose mics that are uh, maybe not quite as sensitive as a condenser, but go more dynamic. So that's kind of my checklist. What's going to give me the best, best performance? Then what sounds best? And then third, what's the environment? Um, the best tool I need to uh, get a good performance out of that. I'll jump on, in. I'll jump. Okay, you, you go, Brett. <laughs> so, uh, I, yeah, I'd have to agree with Spence. Um, I, I will probably lean on the front end of, you know, what asking the artist what kind of venues they're, they're going to play first off. You know, is this a club act? Is this a large format touring act? Is this a, a act that needs something very stable and and uh, point and shoot? You know, that, that may help the negotiation of, is this a copper wire microphone capsule? Is this an RF deployment? And uh, so beyond that, you know, is the artist on wedges or in-ear monitors? I think that's probably my second consideration. And then, uh, and then it gets into kind of what type of, of uh, vocalist is the artist? Or if we're talking, you know, bigger picture than that, what's the source? So is it a, you know, are we talking about drums or vocals or whatever? And I think that this is a primarily a vocal consideration. But so at that point, you know, is it a female vocalist with a lot of power? Is it a female vocalist without a lot of power? Is it a, a, a trio? Um, is it a duet? Is it an R&B act? Is it somebody that's going to be, you know, cu cupping the mic typically, or is it some somebody that's going to be singing very far away? Uh, what's the stage volume that's going to be going on, and how close is that artist uh, with their specific singing technique to a drummer or uh, a big band or a piano? 
Um, and those types of negotiations help me figure out, well, you know, do we need something that's going to be a cardioid pattern or is a hypercardioid going to be better for this type of artists on this type of stage on this type of application? Or do we need to be ready for to put something in the artist's hand that kind of crosses all of these things when they come up in the flight path of a year or a, or a touring career? So what's going to be the same, you know, the, the best thing for a, a Josh Groban or a Diana Krall is not going to be the same thing for you know, a, 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 a lady in a bellum, for example, or or a Rolling Stones type scenario. So what's the artist, what's their performance, what's their engagements for performance look like over the flight path of the year, and what's gonna best showcase their their vocal instrument on uh, in a wide variety of uh, combat zones, if you will, over the year, and let's find out the best thing. And then ultimately at the end, you know, it's, it, it all comes, we'll all probably make jokes about this all day. It's what does the artist want? And sometimes what the artist wants in their hand is not what we want at all. And uh, we have to give first, first right of refusal and be mindful of that. And some of these things kind of take on different shapes. You know, does the artist want a capsule that that looks a certain way? And do we have the opportunity to give them maybe the capsule that works best for us, shrouded by the visual that they might want to do. Uh, sure Products sure does a really great job accommodating all of those uh, 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 visual and creative department artist engagement opportunities. Um, I, I feel very, very well. So that's kind of probably my order. I kind of have a similar way of doing it, but I always think of, at first I go, okay, is it going to be wireless or wired? Because our, you know, our choices are going to be totally different. You know, wired, you're gonna have way more range of stuff to do. If, if it's wireless, then you have to figure, um, you know, which kind of wireless, do they have a deal with a certain thing? Like when I came into Miley, she had a deal with some with a different company and her monitor guy, which is, is another whole thing we'll talk about later. You know, he had a certain thing that he wanted out of that mic, out of a, and nothing else. And for years, it was kind of a fight because when he, whenever he wasn't doing a gig, I'd switch the capsule to something I knew I felt worked better. But then when we had um, some time off, you know, we, we did it the way I usually would do it, where I, I start with at rehearsals with a 58. So I have a, a, a flat line starting point that I've known all my life. And then we'll switch out things from there. And usually with certain artists, we'll, like with Beck, we'll go through and he always has certain ideas of what he thinks works and then we either prove it or disprove it you know and again when i came into his camp he had a certain mic from another engineer and a certain look you know but he didn't really like the sound that he was starting not to like the sound after a while so we had the option to go through all kinds of mics and and, and a lot of times the mic you think will work doesn't work you know with selena gomez i had a thing where the kms8 just came out and me and Kyle, the monitor guy, thought this would be the perfect mic. It's going to work perfectly. It's going to work perfectly. And, and theoretically, on paper, it should have. But when her voice got in there, it didn't work. And the Beta 58 was like way better for her as far as like it added something to her voice that wasn't there, which was good. And she can, you know, even she could kind of hear it in her ears. It just felt better. But but usually it's like a checklist of things of, I, I you know, of course, the front of house guy wants it to sound the best, which would you know, you take in consideration the rejection. Is it going to be on a thrust or not a thrust? But if the source sounds the best through it, and I'll record all the different ones and go through a, a kind of a, a checklist of who comes up the best. But you, again, you have to work it between the artist and the monitor guy. And, and is there wedges, no wedges, you know? So that's kind of my way of going through it. Similar to everybody else, I guess. Paul, your, your mention about the KSM-8 not working reminds me of something I like to say to everybody uh, that's my friend. It's like it's a mic is a different instrument and every voice is different. So literally, you know, it's trying all the different things and the things you might think work don't right. just with any other instrument. And the other thing I wanted to pick up on from Scoop was mentioning cupping because I've done a lot of measurements in this this field is that. Uh, how does the mic hold up to cupping uh, tonally and and how does the pattern hold up? Uh, we know that in pop music, most artists are doing at least a half cup. Doesn't matter who they are. You know, they're at least cupping till that first ridge. And, you know, capsule shape definitely uh, plays into cupping. 
it's how your hand feels on it. I, I feel like some of the capsules almost invite you to cut the whole thing and some don't, but uh, I, I also like to play into that mic selection is, okay, is this person a cupper and how is this mic gonna hold up when they do that? Ever since the 90s, I kind of always have, I've gone through mics and always have taken cup, like just for the hell of it, always tested out different mics going, I'm just going to cup these mics and see which ones work best just to have that in the back of my head when I need it. Because in the nineties, every rock band cupped their mics. It seemed like. Yeah. I, I did, I did a little test with a speaker about the size of a mouth and yep. a wireless and a, a UHFR system. I have here at home. I put on every capsule I could and against its flat measurement, I measured how does this hold up in smart with a half cup and a full cup. And it's like everything you always thought, about how these mics were reacting, there it is on the computer screen. Like, yeah. oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of, I kind of do the same um, as everybody else. Um, the first thing is um, what, what artists I have, um, and it, it that that kind of makes my decision. That's probably seventy five percent of my decision right there. Who's using it? Because. Um, Again, you know, it, are they going to be on a, a larger stage or are they going to be on a do we, do we have a thrust that day? Um, so, you know, and cupping is, is a huge thing, like we all talked about. Um, and most of the artists that I work for, they that's what they do. So, you know, um, it's it's for me, it's what I'm comfortable with and what also the artist is comfortable with. And that's always my first thing. It's who I'm working for. Um, and then I, then I'll go from there and kind of choose off of uh, what actually sounds best uh, in that in the application. Nothing, nothing too crazy. <laughs> Adam, you brought up um, doing a bunch of measurements and some mic shootouts. You want to talk through what some of your process is for that? Um, uh, on measurements or shootouts? Let's start with shootouts since we're talking about picking things sure. and uh, sure. move on so to measurements. I actually recently did a shootout with Josh um, on our last uh, full tour last year. The challenge that we had is that we were going from arenas uh, to sheds and we were even doing some cool little venues where the, the sheds were beautiful, but they encapsulated the stage and they turned the stage into a gigantic horn that turned things back around him. And Josh is a very classically trained pop opera singer. He, I mean, we, everybody is aware of him and obviously can tell his training. So he's got an idea of what he wants that is very, it's great. Um, so we're using a mic capsule uh, from another manufacturer that sounds beautiful, but um, it, it's basically known for being omnidirectional and picking up the world. Um, so my part about a shootout was I started with, before he got on stage, putting all these mics on stage with the band rehearsing and just listening to them. Because with that application, it was all about what is the bleed and what does the bleed sound like? Because um, it's not only just important that you know, you're know you containing bleed, but different mics, the off-axis stuff sounds a whole lot different. And some mics, the off-axis stuff sounds so bad that you just might as well let it come in on something that it's going to sound more natural. So my process with him, because I knew I'd only get so much time, is I went through that kind of stuff. I went through listening to cupping with front of house because I'm monitors on that gig. So standing at the mic at the usual positions, cupping it, half cupping it, doing things we know Josh would do. You know, he sings here. He'll sing here and then he'll sing here, you know. So how does it hold up to both of that? both in the pattern and the tone of the voice. And then once I got it down to three that I thought, you know, that I thought I could present to him, I just put three in front of him because I knew that if I put too many things in front of, you know, him with limited time, he just wouldn't have time to look at them all the way I wanted to. So, you know, my suggestion in the process was that the engineers that we did a bulk of it first, knowing the gig as we know it, and then, once we had that, we could go back and kind of whittle it down to make a decision to like an A or B for the artist, you know, like, hey, we like these two. What do you think? 
cool. Anyone I want to add want... one thing to that before we move on. One of my great, and th this might uh, get into, Jen, get into a conversation later about, uh, about transmission packages and things like that. But one of my favorite tells with artists over the years has been when an artist is on a, on a microphone, on a wireless stick with in-ears and a wireless pack and whatever, when an artist at a rehearsal space comes up to me in a front of house position and they come out to talk to me face to face, and when they leave their ears in and they're talking to me face to face while still listening to them in their microphone, to me that says that what's happening from exit of instrument through technology back into reprocessing of said transducer feels natural to them. It, it encapsulates a lot of capsule choice, tonality, latency, transmission, all of these kinds of things. So when I get an artist that comes in, they pop their ears out and they have a, a talk face to face with me, it tells me psychologically something in that that chain of things that's existing is unnatural by the time it gets back to them. And the times when I do engage an artist and they keep their ears in and they're actually having a face to face close proximity dialogue with me through their technology, to me that says, you know, there's a lot of right parts of this, if not the circle is correct, um, just by witnessing the way that they respond to the to, psychologically to the technology subconsciously. Yeah. Cool. That makes a lot of, that's really interesting, actually. <laughs> um, Tim, Jason, Paul, anything else to add about the joys of mic shootouts? <clears throat> just add with Adam the the what the off axis stuff sounds like and how that's usable or often not usable is as important as the the rejection and um, I mean we can all look at mic specs all day long but ultimately what's it sound like and so paying attention to that and if you're if you're out and you're gonna put it do a shootout in front of your artist agreed two, three choices, man, anything beyond that, it's, it's, you're overwhelming them. And often we don't even have time to, to, to do that, that many. Um, I've only had most, one artist where I did a million mics and it actually worked out, you know? Right. Very rare. Right. Uh, and then what's it sound like in the rehearsal space? You know, if you're rehearsing a tour in a small uh, rehearsal space and then that first shows an arena, you know, uh, paying attention and knowing, uh, using your experience of what is this really gonna be like, because it's about to do a 90 degree change on those, those artists. Um, and uh, I, I would err on the side of being a little uncomfortable at the rehearsal space if I know that when I get in that arena, I'm, I'm gonna need this other these other tools, these other mics, so. Well, the rehearsal space is always gonna be the worst case scenario. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Absolutely. For sure. I don't know, some of the venues Adam's talking about, I've definitely been in the sheds that you oh, yeah. know, <laughs> anything upstage of the proscenium is just oh, yeah. a, either a conical horn or or a death trap of 200 hertz. You know, oh, yeah. the, we've, we've all been in these spaces. Um, yeah, I, oh, yeah. Rehearsal spaces are, are notoriously bad. But if you have the Swiss Army knife when you when you leave the rehearsal space, right. then you can cover a lot of bases once you get in, into uh, all of the other death traps. <laughs> yeah. Right. Always have a backup mic, just like a <laughs> something for like the worst case scenario and be like, hey, we're gonna use this today just in case, you know, because it's we're in a bad spot, you know. We have to fly the PA behind you, you know. <laughs> if that's, that's if, it, took me, if right. it took me all day and it still sounds this bad, it's been a rough day. So I put yeah. a trombone in front right. of me. It's probably the best tool. <laughs> <laughs> and then you get that. the and you get those are the venues you get the uh well, that sounded great for this venue. You know, and you're thinking you had the worst day ever. You're like, wow, how bad does it really sound in here? <laughs> yeah. or the, uh, there's also the psychology of it. And uh, I had, a, I won't name the artist or put them on the spot, but they were always a mental uh, a wreck. And so they walk in. And so you can also use psychology. And they say, well, how is it today? It's really bad. So. Now they're you know, sulking back to the dressing room, and they come off the stage and say, "That wasn't that bad." I know. Well, <laughs> <laughs> are really, really low for you, then you then it's gonna be okay. <laughs> Production managers don't like you doing that, but yeah, whatever. <laughs> the best in those type of venues is when you tell the artist, like, "Hey, just try not to cut the mic as much today, and try to stay on the mic." 
and then they cup it more and they stay further away from it. Just psychologically, they, they don't mean to do it. It just happens to be the opposite of what you want. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's usually my thing. I always tell them, you know, uh, don't 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 cup today. We, we really need to hear what you're saying. So right. <laughs> please, please try to keep, you know, put the tape on it. Don't don't go past that, please. <laughs> I'll throw this in there. We're talking so much about cupping. I, I don't have it done on this mic, obviously, but but. I've seen a couple artists lately put a little quarter inch wide, you know, a Velcro, like the hook and hook and loop, whatever we'll call it Velcro, uh, a quarter inch wide strip of the pokey side, just right around the top. So that when they, when they feel it, they stop because this is uncomfortable with that. You know, we can't all be lucky and have something that says Snoop Dogg. That, oh yeah, that, Snoop Dogg's that, the best. <laughs> that was the best play ever, but anyway. The fact he did it himself, like he he understood that's what he yeah. needed to do, is awesome. So, uh, for those of I don't have a picture of the Snoop Dogg mic, but can someone describe what uh, <laughs> how that how that situation oh, yeah. worked out? So, I think he had like brass knuckles or it's something. It's like a brass. Yeah, it's knuckles, basically brass a, knuckles, a, yeah. a four yeah. finger ring. It's a four yeah. finger ring that says Snoop on it, and it's attached to his his uh, transmitter, if you will. And uh, yeah, it, it looked a lot cooler than cupping because he had his four finger ring. He could show you, but yeah, he couldn't yeah. choke up on it. No, nope. because yeah, like fingers had to go in. So it's he had spots where his fingers genius. would go. Yep, genius. it was awesome. Nice, cool. All right, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in here if I can. I don't think you can see me because oh. I you reach limits. Um, go ahead and jump in. Hey, there I am. All right. Hey. So hey, hey uh, Corey. yeah, Corey. guys, yeah, Jesus, I'm sitting back here going, man, there's so much crap I want to comment on, like Thanks, especially bro. the last, the last thing that you guys were talking about, like uh, Spence, you were talking about uh, the whole psychological thing where it's like, oh man, it's really bad today. It made me think of the whole, hey, can you give me a little bit more in this? And you guys do the fake fader thing or the fake EQ twirl. Yeah, we've all seen that mess too. So it's interesting that you bring that up, and it makes them feel better. Um, so yeah, guys, I mean, coming from this, you know, different venues, different artists, you know, as a monitor engineer versus a front of house engineer, you guys are all probably looking for different things from the PA. I, I've talked to, to engineers who are at front of house are like, man, I have, I have nothing to do with that. Whatever they feed me, I use. Um, that's up to the monitor guy. Uh, do you guys all take that stance if you're at front of house versus monitors as monitors always in charge? Discuss. Go. <laughs> I'm really lucky to have a, a, a monitor engineer that I've danced with for a long time at, uh, at the other end of the hose, Peter Bowman. He's great with Lady Annabellum. And over the years, we've shot out different things. We've deployed, you know, different IEM receivers and microphone transmitters and, you know, side fill type ideas and who's getting what. And I feel like that dance is important. I know that we all we all have different relationships with the monitor engineer. I'm, I'm speaking from the perspective of a front of house and broadcast engineer. Um, we all have different relationships with the, with the monitor engineers or guys at the other end of the hose. We'll say that from, from us, but I believe that that dance is important on some level. Look, sometimes we're walking into a gig where that gig has been a team and we're filling in and, and you know, it's, there's not a reinvention there. Um, and there's a lot of respect. Hey, you guys have been at this for 10, 15 years uh, with this specific artist. T tell me what you know so far. Um, there's there's a lot of that uh, regarding the runway that you mentioned, Co Corey, or like what's happening in front of the PA. Those types of things are, are definitely uh, a, a, a monitor conversation for me. Hey, are you compressing artists in their in ears? Because that's going to cause them to eat the mic a lot less. And at 45 feet in front of the runway or uh, in front of the PA on the runway, man, that's going to be making my job pretty hard, mm -hmm. depending on PA, depending on shed, depending on those things, depending on the dynamic range of the artist. So I think that those kinds of conversations and negotiations are 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 very real. You know, hey, what's going on in Earland for, for the artist? What are you doing? Give me a pre preemptive strike so that hey, man, I might need to ring a little tighter out front. I need to, might need to adjust the way I'm handling my, my PA deployment even, um, you know, on the, on the front end to accommodate this environment that the artist is used to working in. Wait, right. I, I have a similar relationship scoop with on Josh with the front of house engineer. Great working relationship. It's constant back and forth, you know, as he's tuning the PA, 
you know, it's, it's just great. It's just a conversation that just gets us both to the same point. Oh, Hey, you know, just to let you know, I'm standing here downstage and you know, your, your center hang is just spilling all over this, or, you know, am I doing something on this mic today? That's just not working for you. Yeah. I think, I think, I think, I think, I think I'm sorry. Uh, Go ahead, Tim. I think, I think the, the, the relationship between um, front of house and monitor engineer is is key. Um, you know, I play in both positions, and I have to be cognizant when I'm a monitor engineer. I got to be cognizant of how I'm treating um, the vocal in their ears because you know he could be here, and if he's talking and he's enjoying himself here, front of house got to you know gain him. <clears throat> um, so I got to be cognizant of where I am as a monitor engineer. Same thing with front of house when I'm on front of house, I got to make sure, Hey man, you know, don't, don't give him that, don't give her that much because if you give her that much, then I got to push harder. And, um, it, 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 for, for front of house and monitors to work cohesively is a huge thing. Um, it, the communication has to be, uh, on point because if it's not, you're, you're going to be running where you're almost mixing two different shows. And that's what you never want. You never want to mix two different shows. You always want to mix the same exact show, whether if it's, you know, whether if it's, you know, if if you're having a good day or not, you still need to be mixing the same show. Um, and, you know, uh, when my artist walks down a, on a, a, in front of the, the PA, I need to make sure as a as a as a modern engineer that I'm I see where they are at all times. So, yeah, it's, it, the relationship has to be per, uh, on, on point. Yeah, one of my artists, I, I actually, well, I have two monitor engineers with them because one does the band and one does the artist. But right. the guy who takes care of the artist himself comes up and is always copying like what I'm doing out. Like he comes up and he's like, hey, what are you doing out front as far as these effects that that he likes? Right. You know, so I'll show him some effects and then like we just kind of work together on everything. You know, like I'll, I'll <clears> listen to what he's doing. He'll listen to what I'm doing and make sure like at least this artist is getting a similar show in his ears that's going on out front because he wants to kind of be in that moment. You know, sometimes in the beginning he was kind of, you know, he'd be hearing one thing on stage and then, you know, there's a whole different thing going on in front of the house. And he was kind of like, right. he'd be bummed sometimes on a show that was great, you know? And then with Miley, with Vish and I, you know, he, we have, we've been working together now for 14 years on her. And it's like, the dance is just automatic with that. It's like, he just, he knows what I need. I know what he needs. And it's like, we don't even have to talk about it. And then when we, when we did do some mic changing in that regard, we both, you know, worked on it together. And it's like this, it works perfectly like that. But yeah, you've been in, I've been in some situations where either the monitor guy rules or, <clears throat> or the front of house guy, you know, I have, to, I have to tell them what to do, you know, if they might not get what I need out front, you know, but it's a super important dance, especially if you have wedges too. That right. just, yeah, makes that game even yeah. more important. Any anything emitting noise in the environment is contributing to front of house and monitors. And if you don't ultimately listen to that together, then you're gonna you're gonna miss it by a mile. Uh, I remember yeah. mixing. Uh, um, probably you guys have all been to the Houston Astro Dome. Oh my oh, yeah. god! Yeah, <laughs> kick, drum, kick drum from Scoop's last show is still going on in there. You know? <laughs> That's your encore, Spence. My kick yeah. drum's your encore. <laughs> and uh, I remember mixing the band Alabama on wedges in that uh, in that stadium, and um, uh, the keyboard player sits down to play, and he, he calls me up on stage. So I go up on stage, and the PA isn't on, and it sounds like a rinky tink piano, you know, ding, 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 coming out of the wedge. And he says, "Man, I don't even know what to tell you. That sounds horrible today." I said, "Oh, wait, hold on one second. Hey, Lee, can you turn on the PA?" Okay, it's on. Great. All right, try your keyboard now. And, you know, it's crushing down on him. And I had to thin it out so much just to cut through the muck of the room so that he could even – he just looked at me and went, never mind, it's fine. It'll be great. <laughs> so understanding that uh, both front house and monitors have to work together to, to get through that show is, is really important. And, um, yeah, it, it's got to be collaborative. And it's more fun, right, yeah. when it is collaborative. It's no yep. fun to be Fighting with the other guy on the other well, yeah, let, let, So let's talk about that, guys. You guys are all talking about this perfect little dance that you all have. When does it become a dance battle? And all of a sudden, we have to make a capsule change. And 
you guys aren't exactly agreeing on it. What? How do you guys kind of approach that situation? Does the artist get involved? Is that is that the kind of the deal breaker there? There has to be a, a scenario you guys have in your careers where you're just like, okay, wait, we're not agreeing on this. Are you guys throwing up, you know, specs? Are we are we testing things? Are we doing shootouts? You know, how does that all work for you guys when it's not exactly gelling? I had a situation a where a monitor guy just changed the capsule without telling me. Like he just he was one of those monitor guys that was just like he was in his own world. He kind of wanted the front of house gig too. But he was just he talked to the artist all the time. And then beginning of the show, I'm like, why is the vocal so thin? Like it's just not there. And then later on I go up and I see the mic and he swapped from one really nice capsule to like their this new capsule that was much thinner without telling me and he's like well johnny wanted to change the mic so i did it i'm like well you could have told me it's also the same guy that that on one tour he decided he had he he was using a paragon too and and it died on him like certain channels died he started unpatching and patching during the show without calling me out front and it was a it was a claire j box so everything's popping and i'm like what's going on and he was just in his own world just like just I have to fix this. I'm like, well, tell me so I can mute the channels that you're mm. moving. Like, just phantom going on and off everywhere. I was like, ugh. It made Call me like you have a phone. I know. Right. It's like I, we both have we both have A2s. Yeah. Like someone oh. talk to each other. We have six people on the staff in audio. It's, that was my nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> Corey, that sounds like a lot like, of fun. Say, you know. Once we leave a rehearsal place, kind of re- let's say you get it at rehearsal. I mean, sometimes you just you you land at an airport and you get to a gig and it's an artist that you haven't met before and it's go time and there's a whole lot of stuff going on at that point, psychology and uh, uh, let me learn how the other guy was thinking kind of scenario. But I'll speak from a kind of my normal tenure with Lady A now for I guess almost 12 years. Um, if we need to make a change, uh, we're gonna it's usually not by their request unless they're complaining about something that we feel like a capsule change would help satisfy as, as a point of their discontent. But if we do that, we usually will have a sound check. You know, if we have a sound check that day, we'll, we'll put out another option on a spare stick and say, Hey, you know, how do you feel about this? Or uh, is today the day you want to play with that? Because most of the time it's not. So uh, mm-hmm. most of that stuff just kind of happens on the fly and you just got to be ready for them to say, yeah, okay, I'm done with my workout and I feel real creative today. Let's give it a whirl versus, yeah. oh, wow, I've got to go on six radio interviews today. It's, today is not going to happen. The sound check is not going to happen. Right. Yeah, wow. I've, I've, what I've noticed working with a lot of you guys over the years, um, shootouts are, are, are few and far between, especially once you're out on the road. Um, you know, I may hand you something that is a prototype and you'll put your headphones on and, hey, check one, two, hey, and and, and you're like, yeah, it sounds pretty good. And it, that's that's the end of it. It's like, oh, man, it, well, can you try it on so-and-so? No, no, yeah. no. Are you Maybe in, the, mind? in the next yeah. rehearsal in six months, no problem. But it's like, oh, man, <laughs> okay. But I totally get it. I mean, you guys, this is your job. That's your boss. You're not going to throw a monkey wrench in it. That's that's not necessary. And, it, and that makes complete sense to me. Um, Paul, something you mentioned, though, um, in, in previous earlier discussion, um, a capsule goes bad or the artist notices that it, there's something had changed. What changed? Did, did the audio chain change? Did the capsule go bad? Is it something that maybe wasn't as durable? W- what changes there? Well, you never know like how the mics get treated, and especially if you're using mics that are the sound companies and not particularly yours that you you might have a capsule and a mic and then it goes back to the shop and then you get a slightly different capsule and mic and you know, the wear and tear humidity, you know, stuff sits in the truck during the summer and it's, you know, it could be a hundred degrees out while that truck is driving across the desert. You know, all that stuff just kind of, you know, did someone jam, you know, especially if it's a condenser mic, you know, and someone did someone shove it into the mic box or did they put it nicely in the mic box? You know, anything could damage the capsule and then it, and then we just, you know, if it's a band, you're not sound checking. You just, you hear the monitor guy talk through the mic and that's about it. Then in the middle of the show, it's like, whoa, that's, that lost the high end I liked or, or got thin or something or, you know, right. so it's just like switch fast. But 
Yeah, I mean, the, the couple of artists I do that notice that stuff, they're pretty, they can be pretty tweaky about, you know, but the first thing I'll check is like, is it something, am I hearing it out front? Because if I'm hearing it, then it's definitely probably the capsule. Because, But if they're just hearing something and I'm, hear, I'm hearing it's fine, you know, but I always go back to my Pro Tools as like, could I use that as like instant replay? Like after right. the show, I'll go back and listen to that versus the previous day and see if it's correct. But it's happened where just the mic just loses that magic, you know, that it had. But these right. things are being thrown around all day long and, you know. Yeah, and, and you so, know, yeah, and I so what's to say what? that sure products, and this is not a shape, a, 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 <laughs> promo like because we're on a sure webinar but i do have to say that i have the best the best luck in uh quality and product <clears throat> longevity from you guys uh compared to most other manufacturers um and to paul's point man look we'll come off of a rainy festival date and and humidity changes and then the condenser mics go back in the in the mic box and then it's 100 100 degrees 106 degrees through a desert to phoenix and when it pops out there's moisture in the box. It, those things are going to change. Um, I, I, there are some manufacturers that I, I could definitely mention here that, uh, you know, if when I have been with artists that are carrying their products, we carry a handful of extra capsules because <laughs> yeah. the capsules just right. don't, yeah. they yeah. just don't survive very well. And some yeah. of them change day to day, you know, are they electronically balanced and impedance is impedance matched electronically versus the actual hardware of the capsule? You know, that that stuff's real risky um, when you've and got the, and the cupping, the cupping, yeah, and the cupping. Yep. destroy a microphone yeah. faster than anything. Yep. Choking yeah. the microphone out. Yeah. It, it, and that was actually what I was going to ask. What is the solution to, hey, this mic sounds different today? Um you know, obviously it's having an extra of that microphone. You're not going to make a complete capsule change on the road in the middle of a show, correct? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I actually wrote the for enough. everything. <laughs> yeah, if, it, if it's bad <laughs> enough, I'm, I'm, you know, we're, we're definitely, you know, pulling up that spare and, and, and doing it, you know, because, I mean, you know, ultimately the, the show is, is what's, what's needed to be, to be right. So, you know, right. if, if I'm at front of the house and, and that mic and that mic capsule is just trashed then you know okay listen let's get that spare up and and you know let's wait till we have an opportunity to switch out because mm. i mean i just can't get any to sound good out here so yeah right yeah and, and, I'll, just, and I'll do virtual sound check before doing a line check so i already heard Same. what it sounded like the night before and it's in my head yeah. and the first thing i check when i go to line check is vocals i don't start with kick i so I'm hearing, <laughs> I end virtual sound check with vocals and I start the line check with vocals. So it's like, I'm, I already had that fresh in my head and I can tell if there's something. And usually the monitor guys are very, that I've been working with are great at like, since they're hearing stuff in in-ears most of the time, they can hear that difference too. And then they'll go yeah. through, like with Beck, he'll go, our monitor guy will check out. We usually have five microphones that are just there for backups and we'll go through all of them just to see you know, is one losing the battle a little bit. And we'll just rotate them too, just so the wear and tear is even kind of. Right. right. Yeah. I, and, and I Scoop, do a bit of rotating too, Paul. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Scoop, I was going to say, um, you know, thanks for the plug about the sure durability. You guys have all been to the factory. So we, we know that we do mimic uh, driving through the desert in the humidity when it's 100 degrees in a truck. We do, we do mimic that. Uh, what I did want to talk about though was, you know, how many of you guys are actually carrying your own capsules for the the talent um, versus renting it from a, a company as far as vocals? We are definitely carrying and we carry for broadcast. We carry for I, I carry for all artists that I work with, unless I'm dropping in with an artist that's not that I'm not working with regularly. But every artist that I work with carries their own capsules. Same here. That's the grand consensus. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 It's kind of it's kind of what I assume, especially with the whole customization thing that I see happening. Um, I so also one last thing new artists. I also encourage new artists to find a familiar flavor. So, you know, let's step way out of the, the global large format touring that we're all speaking of. And let's talk to talk about the new artists with the club gig where they're going into a, a different venue night tonight. I don't encourage artists to go in and put their their own microphone on a on a wedge that is like that 
58 that's there is on that wedge night to night to night to night. But there's a bunch of beer and probably yeah. a bunch of pollutants in that microphone. Carry your own 58 and use it in place of that every night. You know it works. You know it's solid. And you know if there's a problem downstream that it's not you. And that's that's a good uh, security blanket for them to have going in. Um, plus, you know, it's good to be aligned with a product even early on in your career. Yeah. I think health wise, to too. I think stay people healthy are on the road. Uh, yeah, exactly. Well, people are going to start healthy. using their own mics more and more and more now. Oh, yeah. Especially no one's going to use. Especially no one's going to use that. That. No one's going to walk into a CBGB looking place and use that mic anymore. You know. Yeah. No. no. I, I also think to add to that, I also think that engineers should also have an arsenal with them. You know, you yeah. should definitely have a couple of mic choices or capsule choices that you can present to the artist as well. Um, right. That makes sense for you because you know um you just you just never know what you're going to walk into and it's always good to have a good capsule or a good mic on your person yeah tim a little let, let's let's dive into that a little bit more so as as a capsule fails or a mic changes from you know previous night to tonight's show and this keeps happening and this keeps happening you almost have to change this capsule. Otherwise, you're going to be going through microphones, you know, one a night, you know, one every other night. Is right. that a scenario where you guys have had to change a capsule? You guys ever had that nightmare happen? Um, with other manufacturers, yes. Um, <laughs> and, and they're not Scoop, here to defend themselves, but yeah, it's all right. Scoop, Scoop, Scoop referred to it. I mean, there there was uh, another manufacturer that was was great. This capsule sounded good, but you just never know what you're going to get tomorrow, yeah. and you yeah. never know what you're going to get right after sound check. So you know, you had to carry at least you know six of them on your person so yep. that you you had it. And um, but we all we yeah. all grinned when when I said that. Everybody everybody <laughs> grinned like we have all experienced <laughs> one or two yeah. manufacturers that had this type of product. So yeah, yeah. 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 So is that just something you guys have to deal with, do you think? I mean, in the middle of the I mean, tour, you're just going to have to keep buying more of these capsules or more of these microphones from this because you can't change? Is that what we're kind of stuck with? No, nah, it happens once, and then, then you know, after a while, you figure it out, and then it's like, okay, I'm, I'm done. Because, I mean, durability is a huge thing in our business. And, and consistency. If, if my console has to come out every night and work every night. Um, I, I don't have the time to sit there and troubleshoot every day. So it's if if I know I'm going to get every night, I, I'll take that over the newest and greatest thing. I mean, you know, and that's what I'm saying. Most of my artists, I don't really have time to to play around. You know, yeah. um, Common doesn't he doesn't really want to mess around with that. So give him a 58, a beta 58 a and we're going to go with that until the, the cows come home. <laughs> so, mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, guys, before I before I pass this on to Ryan, what is your favorite sure capsule and why? Softball question. <laughs> Let me ask you this: Is this a uh, is this limited to vocal consideration or cap sure capsule global? Uh, you know, we're we're having a capsule discussion, so yeah. I I mean, I don't you know. I mean, there's a lot of favorite sure mics out there, so I'm I want to stick with the capsule conversation because I think a lot of questions are coming in, like, hey, what's your favorite capsule on this, and do you guys like this over that? So, what's your favorite sure capsule and why? I I'm boring. I, I'm going to go with a 58 because I can do so much with that, with that mic. I mean, I can take it, use it for my lead vocal. I can use it for my background vocal. And then I can take that and put it on my horns and, you know, let, let, a, let a trumpet blast into it. And it sounds great over all those applications, you know? Um, okay. So yeah, I'm going to, I want to go to 58 and then you take the beta and put it on there and it's an amazing mic capsule. I think the most yeah, underrated one is the uh, SM86. Ooh. I hardly ever see that. And for uh, for the installs that I do that are house and they're not having to tour, I use that one a lot. And, uh, and it works great on male vocal, female vocal. It's like the condenser version of a, of a SM58. Yeah. Um, I'll go a little fancier and say that my favorite is the KSM9 HS version. Um, I got mm. introduced to this one with a uh, kind of a pop hip hop act uh, in clubs. They already owned them and uh, they held up great to the half cup. Uh, they held up great in the proximity to speakers being that we're in a club and I'm a front fill kind of guy. I want that first row to hear everything. So front frills were always 
you know, quite loud and there, and, and it was just great. Uh, the other thing that I like about this version of the KSM9 is that um, the high end is is fairly flat. Uh, the other versions have a have a have a lift which works for some things, but I just find that the, the flatter, really top 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 end has worked better for me. Yeah, I'll add it in if I need it. <laughs> okay, that's cool, another guys. thing people forget. They forget that they can, you have an EQ in front of you, and you can. I'd rather add it in than than the microphone yeah. added. You know? Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. I agree with that. Yeah. I think that's that's a lot of why people try different capsules is just like, well, I don't want to I don't know how to EQ anymore, but you know, <laughs> it can all make a 58 work. Yeah. Right. All right. So hey, I'm gonna pass it on to Ryan. Um, thanks, thanks so much, guys, for discussing all that fun stuff with me. And I'll be in the background if anything pops up. So here comes Ryan Smith with some more wonderful capsule questions. <laughs> Hey gang, thanks again for joining us today. Hope you all are well. Uh, really enjoying the discussion so far. Um, I wanted to jump into kind of award show land. And uh, Jason, you've been doing uh, monitors at award shows for quite a long time. And what are some of the challenges you run into when you've got a lot of artists with different capsule choices? And and uh, how do you how do you manage that? So, um, yeah, I would say working on award shows, you've got uh, the extra dynamic. We talked about the collaboration between front of house and monitors, but on an award show, um, ultimately it's the A1, the, the, the broadcast mixer that's going to choose the capsule, um, with the exception of artist endorsements, of course, that's going to trump the A1. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, it's, a. uh, uh you know, on the award shows, I would say I have a little to no say in it at all, and I got to make whatever I'm given work. Um, and so uh, whatever capsule the A1 likes, that's what I got to test. And uh, often on the award shows, you know, I'll have 30 performance RFs from uh, at least three different manufacturers. And so I got to be ready for uh, any of those mics, any of the, and, and of those 30 mics, there could be uh, who knows how many capsules we'll see, you know, uh, think about the number of uh, different capsules we've talked about here just for sure. I'll probably see all of those, you know, the KSM uh, uh, HS and the KSM 9, the KSM 8, the 58, the Beta 58, some prototype that somebody manufactured for a visual effect. And uh, so uh, you got to test every single one of those uh, in your wedges and your side fills with front of house on as well. Uh, because uh, you just got to be ready for anything that comes up. Um, so there's lots of approach there from the technical side, but there's also the, uh, you know, I guess the, the pecking order. Number one, it's the A1, whatever mics he wants, uh, unless it's an artist endorsement, then we got to use that. Um, and then we have no time to ever play with or uh, manage. <laughs> Uh, I'll admit there's been times when the uh, one side of a uh, overhead is upside down. <laughs> that's how it rolled back out on the stage. And you know yeah. what? You got to freaking fix it. So uh, uh, do what you can. Um, uh, so it's it's a little crazy because you just don't have the luxury of time. You know, usually uh, by the time the artist walks out there, uh, it's you got one pass for audio and uh, the rest is cameras and uh, cameras and lighting. So uh, it's, it's definitely a challenging environment, for sure. I, I would add. Go ahead, Paul. Sorry. I would add that, like, you know, if the front of house engineer for the band and stuff did their homework with the artist, with the mic and all that stuff, it makes it a lot easier. Like I did um, the Dolly Parton thing a few years ago on the Grammys, and I had eight different singers with eight different capsules and eight and like three different brands of wireless. They were all painted white, so they looked the same. But. They actually, everything kind of came up in the ballpark for each each girl. Each girl came out and sang, and and she matched really well. Like, I didn't have to do much EQing to it at all. You know, I thought it was going to be a nightmare at first, like eight different people, and then they all come out and sing. And, it, and, it, and because of each, each front of house person's work with the band, you know, picked the right mics, it made, it made my job so much easier. You know, just, it just, everything was like butter. You know, but it was all different mics, all different everything, you know. Yeah, let's let's talk a little bit about that dynamic, too, because, Jason, um, you, you 
you'll be at your mixing desk at the award show and then each of the artists brings in their own engineers and talk about that how that conversation usually goes um actually that helps a lot so uh most of the award shows um you know i've seen uh sometimes i've seen three or four monitor guys come through or uh, with that same artist and uh it's as we've discussed uh things change so I always try to reach out to all the mixers first uh, before I do anything, right? Because try to be uh, have the most current um, information as possible. And then often, you know, I mean, uh, Scoop, you guys have been coming in on all these shows for years, and so uh, uh, having having the artist mixer uh, dial in a vocal strip or whatever. I mean, that's I, I rely heavily and try to try to get the as much information I, as I can from the uh, mixers because. They're out there every day and understand what that artist wants. I occasionally do uh, the main stage monitors for Times Square for New Year's Eve. And several years ago, after juggling, you know, all of that data comes in on what acts are going to be on the show and what that show is going to really look like kind of the week before. And and having a, a more than one week lead time on that amount of information is gratuitous, for lack of a better, a better adjective. Um, I many years ago built a show file and it was all, uh, you know, your your receivers for the sticks, sure stuff. And I designed the show file for the console that I was on and sent it to all of the engineers that were going to be showing up with rehearsal for with these artists saying, if you want to show up with a file, this is the template for you to drop in. And these are the gains for all your stuff. So if if you build your show file with whatever capsule you've got that's going to go on those sticks or that you're going to bring with this set of gain staging and let's have a preemptive strike so that we're all we're not diving into receivers or transmitters to change uh, gains and all this stuff this is where we're all going to start as ground zero the more you can adhere to that show file opportunity the better you know your five minute your, your three minute changeover with your five minute sound check is going to go that day right. and uh, lastly i think to kind of what paul was saying um, actually, to what Spence was saying in the beginning, I, if if in an award show we've got the three artists or four artists that are co doing a collaboration, and maybe some of them are being tuned live, it's a really big negotiation or consideration to have up front with, hey, if they're on a wedge, well, this is a pretty pretty important factor to have of how the tuner is going to react on one principle that's whose vocal is coming out of that wedge feeding another principle that's not in their act. I don't know if that makes sense, but if what's, what's entering the flight path of the microphone is, is causing a to a live tuner to react incorrectly. That's a big consideration for pattern pickup, gain staging, monitor conversation, what's coming out of that wedge and when, um, and that type of collaborative one artist is being tuned. One artist isn't, or there's four artists that are at different, uh, speed and, and uh, ratios, all of that stuff really could be hosed by a bad monitor mix coming out of a wedge or a side fill or a PA engagement that's not a TV hang. They're, they're all connected. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so for the rest of you too, um, as far as like if, if you've ever had like a new artist coming on to an award show and they're coming into a new environment, They've never performed on the show before. How do you manage the different sound situation that's going on there? Because they're not on their, they're not on their uh, typical wedges, maybe. Or so, what what are some suggestions there? Um, those are uh, those are probably the yeah, most. My thing is to. Sorry, go ahead, Tim. Go ahead. Go ahead, Spence. Go ahead, man. Go ahead. Oh, your turn. I'm um, I think my, my thing is my thing is to <laughs> is to <laughs> it's to really concentrate on the performance. Um, so in those in those environments, um, my thing is really getting the artist to be comfortable in that space. Um, and you know, it's it's yeah, we don't have what we normally have, but you know, uh, go out there. Let's you know, we'll, we'll go we'll talk through everything. Uh, these are ears. If you if you're not used to using ears, then let's let's this is our first time using ears. Then you know this is our first time. But um, it's I think that the biggest thing is is I go I I make sure I get there 
pretty early so that I can talk to whoever's doing monitors to let them know what's ha what's actually happening. Hey, look, this artist is doing this. This is how they this is how they react. This is this is how they hold the mic. This is, you know, give them the whole scenario. And then we got we kind of go through. And if I have time or if we have time, then I'll make sure that I give my notes, you know, cut this and I'll get it as comfortable as I can so that they don't have to really do much. And when they walk out there, I think the, the biggest thing for artists when they're walking onto a award show, because they don't have it's not their crew and it's not their venue. Um, I think the biggest thing for them is that when they grab that mic and, they, and their first uh, sound that they make, it needs to be there. Um, and, and that if, if they can get that comfortability as soon as they put their ears on and as soon as they walk out on that stage and for rehearsal, I think they'll be comfortable. But if they walk out there and there's all kinds of RF issues or something's wrong, they don't know who to communicate to. And there's, you know, five people bef before you hit the monitor engineer. So my thing is if I'm at an award show, I'm always, you know, I'm always on the deck. Um, I'm standing right next to the artist and I'm doing the communication between the artist and the monitor engineer because, you know, they need that. And so my job is to become almost like a crutch or a, a helper to to the artist so that they're comfortable in that zone. It's 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 a it's a it's a psych it's psychology in those situations that Tim yeah. was getting to. It's it's for for somebody who's already going to be nervous in that situation. It's a big award show and they're they're brand new. It's literally being there on their behalf to to not only explain what's going to happen and how it's going to happen, but to kind of pump them up. This is going to be great. You're doing great. And just like continuing to be the person on their behalf, on their team right. to say, you know, hey, this is what happens here. This is how we do it. And and gosh, you're doing a great job. You know, like you're it's going to be great. It, reassuring them that they're going to have a good time. Yeah. That make us the audio whoobies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I always uh, try to establish that communication, right? Because typically I'm nowhere near the stage. I haven't been near a stage on an award show in, I don't know, 15 years. And so uh, there's often a deck guy that's a monitor guy, and he's got directly, I'm just a fader monkey. That's it, right? <laughs> monkey push fader, monkey get banana. So uh, it's always best to have uh, the artist's um, monitor guy on deck so that they can see and communicate and make that artist comfortable and uh you know it's so even if they do come up uh, to my world maybe tweaking the channels give me some pointers or whatever i always say man make sure you're on the deck uh because i want your artist to see you and know that he's being taken care of uh it's just giving that comfort level right and then um and uh uh, that that's that's a big deal. Making sure communication is established, and then that artist is comfortable. Because uh, I mean, you think about the mental state of okay, I'm getting ready to walk out onto the stage in front of TV land globally. I mean, that, that's a that's a lot of stress on on some of them, and uh, they're about to fall apart. So uh, having having people that they know around them is going to be important. Well, we're uh, we're about at our hour here, but we have you know several questions that have come in, and we've still got a, a few things that we wanted to ask you. I just wanted to let people know that we're we're going to be going over. So if you can stick around, that would be great. Um, one of the things we wanted to discuss was uh, plugins and outboard gear. What do you find useful in your vocal chain? Preamp, high pass filter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I'm going to try to, I'm going to always try to lobby for less is more. Um, you know, I, I would love to, uh, I really want to, I really want to have the right choice of mic with the right choice of preamp and the right choice of console. And if it could be that great um, all the time, that would be nice to have it that, that simple. Um, I definitely want something that takes uh, less time and uh, is not artifacty. I don't mean not colorful. Um, but not, but isn't introducing items to to the flight path of the the audio signal that are uh, producing things that I need to manage downstream. I think a lot of the use of plugins lately, depending on manufacturers, have um, fairly specific and often uh, homogenized harmonic distortion algorithms that that exist with them. And when you stack up plugins, uh, even if you're not doing much to them. 
uh, you might get the flavor of the different plugs, but what you're what you're getting downstream is is an exacerbation or or uh, exponential heightening of a very specific set of uh, of fixed harmonic values. And some ma manufacturers suffer this less than others. But you know, be mindful if you use three plugins from one manufacturer that has a very similar set of THD uh, artifacts, then you put a compressor downstream regardless of manufacturer, and now you're bringing all that stuff up and then doing something else to that later. Now you're 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 going to likely have to manage these these uh, harmonic goodies that existed on, on an individual basis as an overabundant distraction further downstream. Uh, um, so things that I like, um, you know, I love UAD stuff. I'm not using too much of it live. Uh, I, I use Wave stuff live and, and I do it sparingly depending on the console and depending on what I'm doing. And honestly, you know, with consoles these days, I've been a, a fan of a lot of stuff that's going on in some of the console platforms. The Revage stuff sounds really great. Um, the the I, I'm even a fan, I know uh, Paul is of the S6L channel strip flavors i think that there's some good flavors in there um and then you know for for some of some acts that aren't looking for flavors there's you know the studers and and the digicos that are a, a really clean and robust channel strip without so much thd so uh, depends on kind of the act the artist the source wh where you're going with it and what you want to do with it i and i expand on in monitor land i'm also keeping things simple first um, a, a one consideration that I think as we talk about what's your vocal chain, at least in monitor land that I see a lot of, or not a lot, too many engineers not considering is that every plugin we add ha has the potential to add latency. And I'm a firm believer that the shortest path between the singer's mouth and their ears is best, whether they notice three milliseconds of latency on their voice or don't notice it till 10, I guarantee you it's a better time for them the shorter that figure is. Mm -hmm. So um, my, in monitors, my vocal chain thing is always, you know, uh, the simplest thing first, and then let's add things as, as we need them. Uh, I've been starting uh, with Josh, for instance, I everything starts with an Eve Shelfer channel, just, you know, it's it's just a front end that without that in analog land, I can add some flavor to it without, you know, before it touches the consoles instead of, you know, a stack of a bunch of plugins that push latency further down the road and, and a latency is an issue for him. Yeah, I, th I think guys get stuck in um, mixing plugins as opposed to mixing the show. And, you know, they spend their time putting this one and this one and this one and this one and getting this mic that is really unnatural um, and then trying to fit that in back into your mix. And it's just you, you start mixing, you start you spend your time over here on the computer as opposed to being at the console and doing what you need to do. I mean, but, you know, some some things like the last tour I was on, I inherited the session from the monitor engineer that I actually filled in for. So his his wave session was quite robust it was it was large you know on, on one of the mics there was like probably four or five different plugins cool. um and so what i did over the course of the the tour i spent my time replicating what he was getting by going to less plugins and seeing how i can do that yeah. eq um because it was just taking up so much i mean and then as you take off a plugin you realize how much color it added to the actual vocal and it you kind of work against yourself because you put this plugin in to you know get this sound and put this plugin in to get this and you know it, where I if I go all the way back and I just probably bump out 500 out of my EQ it there you go it's cleans it all the way up you know so huh, I mean weird. you know I mean for me and monitors what I like to do on on my vocals especially if the vocal is quiet or vocalist is if there's a lot of stuff going on I, I like that PSC. Um, that's really cool um, if you use it right. Um, a lot of guys don't know how to use it right, and they keep it on when they're trying to ring out wedges. And when that when that wedge or or something opens up, that that mic, you know, uh, it's it's a full gate. So, you know, um, I like I to, I like to ring out with too. <laughs> Oh yeah. Oh man. Yeah. You, I mean, that's, <laughs> I've seen that too. I've seen that too. And it's you know, so I like to use it um, sparingly. And then I'll you know, I'll throw some other things on top of it, especially if I'm if I'm working in a tight situation where if I know my plugin and, and 
I'll I'll throw it on or something like that to get something quick. But usually, I'll if if I have the time, I'll try to use my console more to get what I want, and then add the plugin for effect later. I always I I have a an analog strip of stuff I use that I I bring everywhere just because I like having my lead vo just for my lead vocal, but like I like having it there so I can grab it quickly and I can use any console and have like like Beck had to do a uh, like a one of those Grammy party things and it was on a different console so I just they just brought my my chain I put it on his mic and even though it was totally different console the minute he pushed up, the minute I pushed up the fader it was just there's my sound that I have but I like just having the knob that I can grab it I don't have to go find the screen it's it's only adding the one trip's worth of latency you know I don't have a million plugins because sometimes plugins fail. You know, and it's like they're actually worse failing because you don't see it. At least with analog gear, you can be like, well, that's not working. And you know it. And then every day I also just start as far as a workflow. I bypass everything and hear the mic by itself for a second and then just pop things in one by one to make sure everything's working because it is analog gear and it can break. Everything breaks, you know, but it's just it's, it's just my you know, I, I own it, so I have it, and it's always a distressor or something. You know, but even on broadcast, I'll bring the same thing and use it, and it's just it keeps the consistency without having to have a different platform or different versions of plugins. And plus, like Brett was saying, every plugin you add adds this certain thing that kind of shifts the phase a little bit. Even even though it's it's still adding latency, but it's that harmonic thing that each each plugin by itself might sound great, but you, you stack four of them and you get this slightly weird phasey high-end thing that could happen you know uh, we've had this question come in uh, for the panel what do you see as the biggest mistake in capsule selection that a younger mix engineers make and why get in the capsule because someone else has it. and didn't listen to right oh, say that again jason sorry the one that they were given for free and never listened to <laughs> or getting a capsule because someone else you've seen someone else do it and you you don't really actually take the time to study the capsule homework i'd have to say homework do you, you know just because you saw a cool ad in the magazine and that's not to say the cool ads aren't cool but you know I, I grew up and there wasn't a web there wasn't the internet and there wasn't a forum like this for discussion and there wasn't a you know people can instagram me or facebook message me and i i love to field questions for for people especially budding artists and acts you know well t tell me what you want to do but um just because it looks cool doesn't mean it's going to work for you and just because it works for somebody great doesn't mean it's going to work for you so tell us what you need or ask know what you need before you go try to pick the right product for, for something. It's kind of like saying, hey, can you make my car go fast? Well, well, what kind of car do you have? Well, I haven't bought one yet. <laughs> well, well, do you need to go fast? What kind of car are you already driving? Is it working for you? Um, those kind of things. So I think doing your homework is what I would add to that. And just listen to them all. I mean, like with Miley, I'm using a, a 565. It's, you know, that I got as a talkback bike, you know, at, at one of the things. And she liked, the look of it and Vish and I gave it, she wanted to use a cabled mic and she wanted a vintage look. And just as a joke, I was like, Hey, look, how do you like this? And she's like, that's awesome. And then when we used it, Vish and I both agreed like this really works with her voice. It, it had everything we needed and it was probably the best her voice has sounded. And it's been great, you know, and it's what a $70 mic, $80 microphone, you know, and it, and it works awesome for her. <laughs> There you go. There's a picture of it. Yeah, nice. <laughs> there you go. That's great. Yeah. So, so you never know what's going to be the winner. You know, it's like it's just list. Just you know, a newer engineer just needs to listen. And if he's hearing something weird, not working with a vocalist, just be able. Mm -hmm. We'll talk to your monitor guy first, and see if there's something that that you could try and see if it's better or or not. Just just don't live with something because you're going to live with it. You know. I know some some older engineers even that they always use this particular mic for everything. And they, you know, and one over the summer was opening up for us and he's using this mic that he used with Christine Aguilera with a rock band. And the guy's cupping it and do all kinds of stuff. And we're like, why don't you change the mic? He's like, that mic always works for me. And it's like, 
Well, it's not right now. It's like it hasn't been all summer. You know, why don't you just change the microphone? And the same guy would come out and sing on a stick with a 58 during our set and sound fantastic. And it's just like after 30 shows, I'm like, why don't you just use the 58? I'm like, I'm not doing anything to it. And your singer sounds better when he comes out and sings on my show than he does on your show. You know, and he won't do it. He wouldn't change, you know. So it doesn't have to be new engineers. It could be old engineers too. I'd like to add uh, or encourage uh, younger mixers, since that's kind of the the question ask, ask the person asking the question. I guess I'd love to encourage young budding engineers to take a vocal class on how to sing and how vocal mechanics actually work. Um, it's no different than than your mixing guitar players. Take a guitar class. Take you know. Frequencies are notes, and these are all instruments with their own set of specific mechanics and physics, and and uh, uh, they're, they're transducers in ways. And I got schooled uh, not too many years ago on, uh, I thought I was having a technology issue. Hey, it's a new mic product from new manufacturer, and I put it on this artist, and it sounds like that. And it's just, I think there's a problem with the product. And, you know, I go, I'll bring other engineers in, and it, guys are hearing this stuff going, man, that's really, uh, it's just very two specific notches. And and my, my girlfriend's a, a classically trained singer with a lot of background in opera. And we're standing in the kitchen and she's been hearing me run around the house for a couple of weeks talking about two seven and four K and this stuff. And, and she's like, I don't know what this, these numbers are that you're talking about, but, but when the artist sings the line like this, does it sound like this? And she sings the line. And I'm like, no, if it sounded like that, it'd be amazing. And I turn around to the coffee pot and start pouring another pot of coffee back to back in the kitchen. And she goes, does it sound like this? And I'm like, set the cup down. I'm like, yes. Yes, that is exact. Okay, give me a class. Tell me what this mechanism is doing so I can honestly better fit the technology with the instrument because that that made a different microphone capsule change. That made a different negotiation of plugins, uh, uh, dynamics downstream. And um, yeah, so, so the better you understand the instrument, the better you can deploy the right technology to fit it. I had a situation where the kick drum where you know kick drum is a kick drum right and during rehearsals it's like for some reason we couldn't get any low end we swapped microphones swapped microphones swapped microphones vish couldn't get anything really thumpy out of the out of the wedge behind them out front it was like i was adding a lot of stuff and it, and i just one day was like we were at center stage and i'm like okay because he was using this weird 24 by 24 kick drum which physically i'm thinking to myself oh that doesn't really work but so I'm like, just go get a, a standard 22 by 16 Ludwig. We get that, we switch it out. He hits the thing and, and the drummer almost fell off without changing anything. And it was just like, you know, it was the drum. And I kept saying it was the drum and the drummer kept saying, no, that's stupid. It should sound huge. It's this long 24 inch thing. And I'm like, yeah, but you're this way and this way. You're making Collapses. a perfect null yeah. in the middle, yeah. you know? Yeah. And it was just like, you know, anything from a kick drum to a vocal is always make sure that the, the source, what it's doing too, you know? Always. Well, yeah. that, that that's a great into this next question that we, we had from somebody. What about the instances that a singer uses something non-traditional, something like an artist who wants to use an SM57 for a vocal mic, broadcast versus live versus monitors? With or without a windscreen. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Petty did it for a long time. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. And then and then there's always my favorite, the Unidyne 4. That was a vocal mic everyone used in the 70s. Every rock band picture. Yeah. Fortunately, I mean, you don't I, make I think, it anymore. I think, I think the key to that is, I mean, as as a your first thing as an engineer is really is learning how, um, as everybody has been saying, first learn how the instrument works, whether it's a vocal or it's a, it's a played instrument learn how that works but your thing as an engineer is to know what you're doing enough so you can get the best tone out of that um out of that instrument and um you know for for me it's funny because with, with cardi you never know what she's going to do you know she may she may be up on the stage and then the next thing you know you're looking up and then she's climbed the scaffolding and she's you know two feet away from the hang you know <laughs> you never know what she's going to do my job with that is to really make sure I ring out that 
room, whether, you know, I saw I have my monitor engineer walk the entire stage, walk the whole length, walk up and down and make sure I ring out and to get the best sound that I can out of that mic. And I mean, whether it, it, if I'm going to use an artist that has a 57, well, I got to sit there and make sure that I can make that 57 sound really good. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of people get hung up on what kind of uh, mic it is or what kind of capsule it is without really realizing that at the end of the day, it's really your vocal performance. And if you can really work with your artists on their vocal performance and how their, their mic handling technique and all that stuff, it doesn't matter what capsule you have. If they're, if the way they're holding the mic is bad and if the way they're, 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 they are with the mic is bad, you're not going to get a good sound out of it at all. Uh, had a question come in about a uh, preferred choir mic capsule. I I have to say, if I was going to pick, you know, I didn't comment on what my favorite Sure capsules were uh, from a handheld vocal performance. It's going to be whatever's right for the artist, but I would, I'm inclined to lean on the 58 because it, like Paul said, you know, always know what you're going to get. We've been doing it for years with this. We, we know it's a static item, but regarding small diaphragm condenser, type ideas, which I would consider for choirs, depending on stage deployment and whatnot. I love, one of my favorite Shure products is the WL-104 uh, or uh, 184 and 185, the lav mic elements. I mean, for lav mics and podium mics, I I still, man, it's it's great tonally, it's great off axis, it's great, at, it's, it's a quiet mic, so in some of the choir stuff that I've done, especially when creative doesn't want a bunch of large diaphragms in front of them or whatever, you can get the little wire spinny thing that the 184, 185s fit in that goes on a mic stand and you can just bury them. And they're great, great pattern, great pickup patterns. I think it's a great sounding element. I did a gospel choir tour for a couple of years and our challenges were a little different. We couldn't use a little, you know, 184, 185, because I needed width and it, a large diaphragm like a KSM 32. I had 24 uh, that sat in the risers, just you know, as, as snug as we could get them, because I had six different choirs at every show, and they were always a different choir. So um, that worked really well for me, and and I was able in that show. I mean, I had you know a loud choir. We could hit 106, 107 A weighted out front out of that. Not that that happened super often, but like if you've got a really good choir and they've got some pipes, those, you know, you've got the the grid of them lined up just right, you get a lot out of it. Yeah. You know, Come, coming out from a there. church background, we always cut each other off, Spence. I'm going to let you go. <laughs> good timing. <laughs> Your time. <laughs> got more latency. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, we, use, uh, we did a shootout uh, at a church that um, there was a choir and pipe organ. And um, we ended up going with, uh, we multi-tracked a bunch of them, did a bunch of, uh, quite a few passes. And uh, the 181s, uh, those 181s sound really good. And um, uh, we were all pleasantly surprised. And, uh, and it was the typical, um, you know, the uh, Neumanns and Sheps, and we had quite a few in that lineup. And those 181s performed really well. They sounded did great. Did you use that cardioid or super cardioid on that? Uh, in that particular church, we actually did Omnis. Omnis, so yeah. A lot of the sound of the room is a cathedral. So it was a beautiful sounding room. So cool. we, um, a really versatile mic too. Pianos, jazz yeah. overheads. Love them. I mean, yeah. Really, really. really Love them. I've, I've seen guys even use them on snare drums and stuff. And, and it's a great, yeah. great drop in for the bottom snare mic placement yeah. scenario too because of the side address. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Toms sound great on Toms. Absolutely. Well, um, anybody else want to add to that? I was just going to go off what Adam was saying. I, I mean, I, coming from the church background, uh, a 32 or a 44 was always essential for choir because, you know, we used the, the audio technique as the hanging um, mics, and those those just never worked out the way we wanted. And then when we went to the 32s and the 44s, they were they were great. They were they really held up to a lot. And um, so, yeah. 3244 for choir for me. Cool. Well, I'm going to throw it back over to Corey. He's got another question for you. 
I'm in hit it and sitting here with waiting with bated breath to get back in this conversation with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, in all seriousness, I think that uh, a lot of the folks that are still with us on this call, 180 so people still here, everybody's at home, everybody's working from home. Are you guys in particular working with any artists that are streaming from home, recording from home? And what mics have worked really well for that application? whether they're doing it on their own with your assistance or if you're in the same room or are you using any sort of software to manipulate their their side of the chain? What's worked really well and, and what suggestions can you, we talk about with this? We're doing a, a lot of stuff with Lady A and the, all the stuff that's, that they're live streaming with uh, as of, the, this has been a, a an evolutionary process, mind you, because they're not in my presence. So working with them remotely and uh, helping them deploy uh, technologies that they can easily use, because that's a very real thing. But the SM7 and SM7B, you know, can't can't really say enough good things about it. Um, I uh, I have not heard your your plug-in uh, mic pre for iOS devices. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Thank you, sir. The, the SM7 <laughs> SM7B scenario for sure. Um, is is definitely worth its weight in gold in these times. At least it has been for my artists. The MV88 uh, stuff has been used quite a bit, uh, at least on its on the front end of these engagements. And they've now that we're able to to have a little more hands-on te uh, technology with them, it's moved into the SM7 or SM7B in in the case of uh, uh, my artists. Right. I'm curious how many artists are going to want to take their SM7Bs now out for live shows because now that they've yeah. used them, like everybody's using them it's the most famous microphone in like on tv right now it's it's yeah. probably 95 percent of the time with the exception of a u67 on a couple of artists because they're showing yeah. off but they asked well, them I, love, I, love, sounded better. <laughs> I love watching the price like you know i, I had some artists saying hey can, can you get me some one of these tomorrow and I'm like, well, you know, Guitar Center sold out and blah, 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 blah. So I'll look on Craigslist or eBay. And I'm like, wow, man, an SM7B's price just went through the roof. Yeah, it's yeah. $1,100. Yeah, it's we definitely can't make, the most We can't make them fast mic. enough. Yeah. yeah. Not making them fast enough, but we're, we're trying. We're trying, everybody. It's, it's such a versatile mic, though. That's why we totally. included it with our kit because we've had management. We've put packages together for management, and they'll send it to one of the band members. And okay, look, you can use this on guitar. Uh, send it to another band member, and they're playing cajon. And then it goes to the vocalist, and they're using it on vocals. So it's such a virtual, uh, versatile mic that I can put that one microphone in the kit, and everybody's happy with it. So yeah. it's still one of my favorite hi hat mics. It's a yep. great hi hat mic. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. All right. I've used my hi hat forever. <laughs> so, uh, Paul, you, you can you talk a little bit about? Um, the addition of the cloud lifter to the SM7 because I, I think a lot of people don't actually know that there's a mic that needs a little bit more gas than than a standard mic pre is going to give you. So can we discuss that a little bit? And I'm sure you yeah, guys well, are all familiar with that as well. Well, the SM7 by itself, the 7B going into like a really good pre is, is great. But if you go into something kind of not quite as nice, it's the impedance. I'm not sure if it's the impedance or what it is. It's just it, you need to add so much that it gets a little noisy. But the cloud lifter or a couple other products similar, you put it in front of it, and the mic just becomes even better than it already is. You know, it's like I have a friend that she has like a little focus right thing, and she's like, I always have to turn the knob all the way up to get yeah. this thing to sound to be the right level. And then you put the little cloud lifter, and it's like it's like having a condenser mic almost. It just gives it a little. A little push of what it needs because i think when it was originally invented it's just it probably matched the pre's of that time better you know and yeah. it does become it even still a very real thing and not something that people talk about a lot and yeah, the right. sm7b is the is the most popular item these days in my opinion that when the impedance is matched correctly or you have a impedance matching transformer on the front end then you really get a lot of goodie out of that mic but when you yeah. have a transformer or an electrical opportunity that is not impedance matching in the prosumer consumer world, uh, those you really do introduce a lot of noise and the noise floor is really high. Yeah. And you get it to a usable gain value. 
Yeah, I think it's important to, to note that, like uh, with Paul, a focus right is just not gonna. It's it's yeah. it's it's good. It's it's nice piece of gear, but it's not gonna give the the juice that's needed for that mic. That's well, even a fifty eight, if you use the focus right with the fifty eight, and you're this far away from the fifty eight, it's not as good. But at least with the fifty eight, you can get really on it and make right. up the gain. The right. SM seven, you're it, you're at that. You can't use the proximity effect to your benefit there. So, right. but the cloud lifter right. definitely. Or there's a couple other products similar, but they're all around the same price. Yeah, but yeah, that they are. Yeah. Makes it a whole new thing. Yeah. Anybody else doing any sort of recording from home, helping artists live stream, or guys working on your own stuff at all? All of the above. My place is turned into the... a live streaming environment, HD cameras and lighting, and and you know remote transmission and all of that kind of stuff too. Um, trying to help a lot of artists you know get fitted with the right technology that's easy for them to use or the best fit a lot of people asking me you know how do i get more intelligibility on my vocal when i'm sitting on my couch and i need a wide shot on my iphone you know what's the best way to not have you know an sm7 up in my grill um you know i mean today it's you know it's, it's one of your uh, vp82s um, oh nice, nice. yeah so that type of product you know it's out of the camera shot and gives you nice intelligibility um there's a lot of solutions and you guys products are really at the forefront of those kinds of conversations as well. Can we share your address scoop? If, if, if any of these people watching want to go and get some audio and lighting and camera work done, they can just come down to your place. Is that good? Yeah. That yeah. And, and your honestly, business? Like, I, I don't know how everybody else feels about this, but <laughs> I, 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 you're more than welcome to put my, my uh, Insta handle uh, or Facebook handle on there at Brett's place productions um, I am there. I will. I gladly return emails. Um, you know, when I get an onslaught, it might take me a bit, but I'm usually pretty good about getting through everybody. If I can't answer the question that you have, I will get you in the hands of somebody that is better suited for you. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, we're here to help you. All, all of Very us. Cool. I think we're probably Very cool. Very cool of you, sir. Very cool. I think the live streaming is going to be this. It's not going to go away too soon because it's yeah. it's now that it's getting better and the technology is kind of coming together faster a lot more people are going to be like well i can't make it to new york to do this show and and la and do this show but maybe i can just do one place and do two different little things for both shows on the same day and save all that travel money and stuff like that is it's going to be it's going to be a really good thing and then even broadcast mixing from other places you know like you know a lot of these like coachella or stuff that would take the front of house mix and just add add some things into it you know, some audience mics into it. It would be now you can have someone like like a John Harris mix from home, you, you, a full broadcast, and then do a, a festival the next day, thousands of miles away. You know, like so the whole live streaming thing is going to only go like become more of a better game. You know, for everybody. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Solo Tech, we've put together a lot of packages um, for doing live streaming and broadcast, to, whether it's a church or like these mobile kits that we're sending out to artists and managers. Uh, so yeah, same same thing. We're we're here to help, and there's lots of choices out there. Uh, and a lot of them aren't expensive either. I mean that that MV88 kit is that thing's amazing for for what yeah. it does. And I remember Ryan when you first showed it to me, um, I didn't know what the price was on it. And the first time I heard it, I think it was some of the the uh, it was some marching band, lots of dynamics, lots of loud uh, snares and dynamics. And uh, I first listened to it and said, well, I mean, this sounds great, Ryan, but who's going to afford to buy this? He's like, it's like 179 bucks. What? <laughs> yeah. So, it's amazing. Yeah, I did. Bikes. It doesn't have to be expensive. Attaches right to the iPhone. Like Scoop said, it's, it's got to be easy enough for an artist to operate. And we all know how to operate this. So, yep. yep. Right. Hey, and I'll just say, go to the Corey if you want to plug any of these items, because you know it's uh, for a lot of people that aren't reading magazines or constantly surfing, you know, uh, threads that have this type of technology, but are looking for solutions like this. You guys have a couple really point and shoot solutions. One is in your hand yeah. Yeah. that might yeah. be worth mentioning, or if you have an address that people can find direct access to these type of streaming technologies with Sure, I think that that would be a a, a link that post engagement a lot of people would hit. Yeah, we'll have somebody put that in there. But this is the uh, MB51, which is a, a larger diaphragm condenser microphone, which is uh, 
great for podcasting, vocals, instrumentations, whatever you want. It's very plug and play. I think it's $200. Um, DSP controls on the front, very easy to use. A lot of this is a lot of this has been going out to the to the artists who aren't as technically inclined. So um yeah. that's one of the options as well i mean if you google sure motive you'll come up with the whole arsenal of mics that are available out there so i think i think the fact that it's super easy is is definitely is something that the artists are really looking for and at least the yeah. friends there are that have called me is like i want to do this but i need this to be easy and yeah uh, and i sent someone to that that sure mic and in the past i've done it i don't know if you still make it it was a little uh USB driverless mic pre that mm -hmm. plugged right into the end of any microphone. The X2U, yeah. yeah, we do still have that. Um, and the MVI is probably the more modern solution okay. there, where it's it's the little module. You know, I think that Tim is using his over yeah. there. Yeah, um, just I mean, look, the driverless is you. Pl they plug yeah. it in, and you know, anybody plug it in, and it shows up in GarageBand. You can start creating immediately. You know, and. Yeah. and let I think that the not big, be in your way. Right. And the big difference between the X2U and this Motive stuff is this is really portable stuff. I mean, you can plug, I can plug this microphone into my iPhone or my iPad. So I'm truly, yeah. truly mobile. I'm, I don't, I don't need anything else. So, all right, guys, um, I'm going to toss it back to Jen. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with us today. Thank you all who are still on the call with us. Um, Jen, take it away. <laughs> All right, so I just want to close down what uh, this discussion. Unfortunately, this has been super. We're already 30, actually over 30 minutes over. So um, thank you very much to our panelists, Scoop, Adam, Jason, Paul, and Tim. This was a superb discussion. I think everybody had learned a lot. There were definitely lots of interesting questions coming in. So thank you so much for your time on that. Um, just to wrap it up, wanted to remind those folks tuning in uh, that we have our Pro Tech Talk, which is just an open question forum, uh, an hour with the Pro Market Dev team, and you can just come in with any question that you have about your microphones, um, and we'll just we'll just answer them all. So uh, those are the first and third Tuesday every month. So uh, it is on next week. And then uh, also to let everybody know that we are continuing with this uh, workflow webinar series, just like you're tuning into today, uh, every Friday in June. Um, by the way, we are planning one for next month about uh, streaming from home. So, uh, so definitely check the, the webinar schedule for that because I, I know a lot of folks are really interested in that. Um, so, and that's, that's about that. So, um, Thank you again to our guests. Uh, any closing thoughts that you want to share to everyone? Study, 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 study. Listen. Compare. Use your ears. <laughs> study and listen and use your ears. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Enjoy your Friday. Um, I'll see everyone Tuesday or Friday, or hopefully at both things, and uh, and have a great weekend. Thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you, everyone. you guys. Thank you, Thank you so much. Take Bye. care.